thank you and welcome to our second annual T.S. Eliot Memorial Reading made possible through the generosity of the T.S. Eliot Foundation. I'm especially grateful to Claire Rahill and Judith Hooper and on this side of the pond to Blue Flower Arts, to Professor Gates's staff members, Amy Gostanian and Terry Oliver and to Mary Walker Graham of the Poetry Room. I'm going to begin with some brief opening remarks to allow some more people to enter the Zoom room, and then I'll hand the virtual mic over to Professor Henry Louis Gates, Jr., who has so kindly agreed to provide an introduction to Claudia Rankin tonight. The Syrian poet Adonis has observed that there are things that, quote, might not exist except through locution which is to say that certain words don't necessarily name something wholly extant or wholly as yet achieved, but suggest something that might, as Erica Hunt describes, invent us more in the future. Or as Audre Lorde has written, poetry is a vital necessity of our existence within which we predicate our hopes and dreams toward survival and change, first made into language, then into idea, and then into more tangible action, until the landscape of our words, as Edouard Glissant writes, becomes the landscape of our world. In Claudia Rankin's latest book, the word that is trying to become world is justice. And also, as she so powerfully and poignantly reveals, it is us. When talking about what happens to us, who is us? What us? She cites a friend as saying. By putting the words just and us side by side, instead of fusing them into justice, Rankin is creating what one poet has called a language, as in a wedge, a space a breath storing up that interval in which, through which, to forge a conversation. Conversation being something Rankin has come to define as an attempt to stand in relation, to testify with our bodies and say at once, I'm here and here, a venturing of one's hand or one's being into that space toward what Fred Moten has called a grounded differing. Tonight's event is itself such a space, and I cannot think of anyone more capable of helping us to stand in relation than Professor Henry Louis Gates, Jr., director of the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research and the Alphonse Fletcher University professor at Harvard. In addition to having authored or co-authored more than 20 books and creating 20 documentaries, you may also know him as the host of PBS's award-winning program, Finding Your Roots. What his title and resume might not tell you is that in addition to his scholarly, civic, and artistic works, he has also been instrumental in his efforts to help build the collections of Harvard libraries of which the Poetry Room is a small part. Through both his personal dona donations, most recently of Harriet E. Wilson's groundbreaking novel, and through funds raised through the Hutchins Center, he has helped to acquire and provide access to the papers of Nobel laureate Wole Shwenka, novelist Tanue Achebe and John Edgar Wideman, and poet June Jordan, to name just a few. Please join me in welcoming the one and only Professor Henry Louis Gates, Jr., who will introduce our honored guests this evening. My goodness, Christina, thank you. That was amazing. Um, I, I, not my part, but the part about Claudia, that was fantastic. Everybody, round of applause for Christina, please. So this evening, it is my honor and enormous pleasure to introduce uh, person I, I admire, for whom I have enormous affection, Claudia Rankin, as she presents the T.S. Eliot Memorial Reading, <clears throat> a Woodbury Poetry Room event here at Harvard University. Currently, the Frederick Eisman Professor of Poetry at Yale and in departments of African American Studies in English, Rankin has had a long and distinguished career as a poet, playwright, essayist, and educator. Born in Kingston, J.A., 
that's Jamaica. Rankin immigrated to the United States as a child and received her BA from Williams and her MFA from Columbia. The poet's first collection of verse, a title I love, Nothing in Nature is Private, published in 1994, won the Cleveland State Poetry Prize, the first of many accolades and awards that her work would garner. Since then, she's published five more books of poetry and her 2014 publication, Citizen, an American Lyric, won both the Penn Open Book Award as well as the Penn Literary Award, the NAACP Image Award, and the National Book Critics Circle Award for Poetry. Further, Citizen holds the unique position of being the only book of poetry in history to be a New York Times bestseller in the nonfiction category. I love that. Just as her brilliant poetry moves easily among genres, her writing encompasses um, several, including three plays, Help premiered in March 2002 at The Shed in New York City, and in a joint production by Arts Emerson and our own American Repertory Theater, Rankin's play White Card, which I actually saw and enjoyed enormously, was staged in 2018. As well as her three plays, Rankin has co-edited several anthologies, including American Women Poets in the 21st Century, where lyric meets language in 2002, and The Racial Imaginary, Writers on Race and the Life of the Mind, published in 2015. And of course, her own poems have been included in numerous anthologies, including great American prose poems from Poe to the present. She's also been part of numerous video collaborations. In 2016, Rankin co-founded the Racial Imaginary Institute, supported in part by proceeds from her 2016 MacArthur Grant. As well as the MacArthur Fellowship Genius Grant, Rankin is the recipient of a 2017 Guggenheim Fellowship, the Bobbitt National Prize for Poetry, and the Poets and Writers Jackson Poetry Prize. In addition, she's been awarded fellowships and prizes from the American, from the Academy of American Poetry, the Lannan Foundation, and the National Endowments of the National Endowment of the Arts, among many, many others. Please welcome Claudia Rankin as she reads from her most recent publication, a brilliant publication called Just Us, an American conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gates, Christina Davis, and everyone um, for spending this evening with me. It's, I've been looking forward. I'm going to, um, I'm going to start by showing a video because why not um and then and then i will read so first i'm going to share the screen it's always a point of um anxiety will this work because if you can have a basis for where the number comes from and what the situation is that the people who are in it that puts them in that situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, are they more likely to be in this situation than somebody that's not transgender? Mm -hmm. Yes. So so I mean, which I don't know what that is. I'm just saying. My wife has never been part of police violence. Most of the people that I know have never been accused of police of violence. So I, I guess I don't get it. Where that statistic comes from. Because you're white male privilege, so you wouldn't know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. sorry. I'm 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 sor
got to do it. Learn. Let's try and talk. Please. So All right. Hold on a second. No, I will leave. I will file it on your desk. We're not talking about white privilege here. I'm trying to focus on a different demographic. I'm going to keep this professional, and I apologize if anybody is offended. This data that we have here. The okay. So when the, um, the white woman who told the police officer, she was also a police officer, that he couldn't understand um, why transgender people were um, targeted by the police. Um, and she said, you can't understand because of your white male privilege. That woman was put on leave um, and um, given um, the position of no longer having any contact with anyone in the police force. So that's how she was to um, live out her time in the police force because she, because she was a bad influence basically. So, and he, the man who said, um, who brought the charges against her for saying white male privilege, um, nothing happened to him. So that's, that's the state of discourse in um, 2019. I don't know if um, things would have changed by now. But I wanted to begin with a quote by Paul Salon. He, he says, what times are these when a conversation is almost a crime because it includes so much made explicit? What times are these when a conversation is almost a crime? And with that, I will start reading initially the opening poem from Justice. What does it mean to want an age old call for change, not to change, and yet also to feel bullied by the call to change? How is a call to change named shame, named penance, named chastisement? How does one say, what if, without reproach? The root of chastise is to make pure the impossibility of that. Is that what repels and not the call for change? What if over tea, what if on our walks, what if in the long yarn of the fog, what if in the long middle of the wait, what if in the passage, in the what if that carries us each day into seasons? What if in the renewed resilience? What if in the endlessness? What if in a lifetime of conversations? What if in the clarity of consciousness? What if nothing changes? What if you are responsible to saving more than to changing? What if you're the destruction coursing beneath your language of savior? Is that too not fucked up? You say, if other white people had not, or if it seemed like not enough, I would have. What if? The repetitive call of what if is only considered repetitive when what if leaves my lips, when what if is uttered by the unheard, and what if, what if is the cement of insistence when you insist, what if this is, what is, it, we want to keep conscious, to stay known. Even as we say, even in our own way, I so love, I know, I shrink, I mask, I'm also, I react, I smell, I feel, I think, I've been told, I remember, I see, I didn't, I thought, I felt, I failed. I suspect I was doing, I'm sure I read I needed, I wouldn't, 
I was, I should have, I felt I could have, I never, I'm sure I ask. You say, and I say, but what is it we are telling? What is it we are wanting to know about here? What if what I want from you is new, newly made, a new sentence in response to all my questions, a swerve in our relation and the words that carry us, the care that carries. I am here without the shrug, attempting to understand how what I want and what I want from you run parallel. Justice and the openings for just us. I am, um, I wanted to, to start many starts. I wanted to start by looking at um, some passages from Thomas Jefferson, um, which is, you know, from Notes on Virginia, but I, in the, in Just Us, it's called Notes on the State of Whiteness. And I, I love Jefferson because of how contradictory he is, how human he is, how capitalist he is, how, um, you know, on the one hand, he knows to enslave people is not a good thing. On the other hand, he wants to have parties and he needs, he needs somebody to help him out with that. <laughs> so, um, and he wants to buy wine and he wants to buy paintings and, you know, he takes out a mortgage and, and the enslaved people are part of that mortgage. So he cannot, he cannot free them. But it doesn't mean he doesn't know. It doesn't mean he doesn't know. Um, so I wanted um, to begin with the section that um, starts their griefs are transient. This, uh, uh, you obviously know this is an erasure, but I don't, I don't really see it as an erasure so much, but as a document recreated to bring forward places in the text that might um, be lost um, by the words around them. Their griefs are transient. And before I go on, I, you know, I don't know how many of you watch the trials, but um, the thing that struck me the most was the number of ways in which different witnesses said, you know, it's too much. All of this is too much. And it's too much. And I try to stay in my body or it's too much. And it's upsetting to see somebody die. You know, the, the defense was trying to claim that people were not capable of, of really assessing what the police was doing because they were angry. And they're like, no, it was just upsetting to watch somebody be killed, be murdered. Their griefs are transient. In general, their existence appears to participate more of sensation than reflection. To this, we must ascribe their disposition to sleep when abstracted from their diversions and unemployed in labor. An animal whole body is at rest and who does not reflect must be disposed to sleep, of course. It appears to me that in memory, they are equal to whites, in reason, much inferior. And I, I, I feel like these thoughts by Jefferson um, are thoughts that the defense actually continue to make in the trial um, by insisting that people don't, don't know what they see. They don't know what they see. So 
So um, I have on one of the things that I, I did in, in this book is not everything is written, but everything is um, forced in one way or another to meet the lyric. And so one of the um, poems in the book, which I'll read, is by James Baldwin from The White Man's Guilt. But it wasn't, you know, it's not a poem. It was just lineated by me into the lyric form. James Baldwin. I have often wondered, and it is not a pleasant wonder, just what white Americans talk about with one another. I wonder this because they do not, after all, seem to find very much to say to me. And I concluded long ago that they found the color of my skin inhibitory, this color seems to operate as a most disagreeable mirror and a great deal of one's energy is expended in reassuring white Americans that they do not see what they see. This is utterly futile, of course, since they do see what they see. And what they see is an appallingly oppressive and bloody history known all over the world what they see is a disastrous continuing present condition which menaces them and for which they bear an inescapable responsibility. But since in the main, they seem to lack the energy to change this condition, they would rather not be reminded of it. Does this mean that in their conversations with one another, they merely make reassuring sounds. It scarcely seems possible. And yet, on the other hand, it seems all too likely. And I'm gonna stop sharing now, but one of the things that has happened this week since, you know, it's only been um, two days since um, Chauvin was convicted, is that I feel like many people and many of them white people um, want to put everything to rest with a decision that is, somebody called it an exception to the exceptions. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's good that it happened. I'm not, I'm not questioning that, but it has nothing to do with the system at large. We had a judge who, who claimed that um, Maxine Waters by calling um, for a response if, if justice wasn't served, um, that would give the defense the ability to appeal, which they no doubt will appeal. And so, you know, we, we can be pleased that something that should have been ordinary happened but we can't be deluded into thinking that the system itself has been fixed by a single moment, a single exception. I just wanted to say that because, because it is. The piece that began Just Us was an essay written um, for the New York Times on talking to white men about white privilege. And I, you know, I, I don't know why I started that, but I, I, I thought it would be interesting to know what they were thinking since they control so much of my life. I mean, you know, the president of the college where I teach, the university where I teach is a white man. The white man um, who solicit 
me at the New York Times to work. I mean, all of them good people. I'm not saying anything against them personally, but um, but they they are in some way in charge of my life. If we look to see who's in positions of power across the board, many of them are white men. So I thought, why not ask them about what they were thinking about all that they have? And so that's how I got myself into this essay. But I wanted to, um, to read just the, the section on the, the final conversation I had. Not long ago, not long after the last conversation I had on a flight, I was on another flight and sitting next to a white man who felt as if he could already be a friend. Our conversation had the ease of kicking a ball around on a fall afternoon, or it felt like stepping out the door in late spring when suddenly the temperature inside and out reads the same on your skin. Resistance falls away, your shoulders relax. I was, metaphorically, happily outdoors with this man who was open and curious with a sense of humor. He spoke about his wife and sons with palpable affection. And though he was with me on the plane, he was there with them as well. His father was an academic, his mother a great woman. He asked who my favorite musician was and I told him the Commodores because of one song, Night Shift which is basically an elegy. He loved Bruce Spinstein, but Night Shift was also one of his favorite songs. We sang lyrics from Night Shift together. I can still hear him say, oh, talk to me so you can see what's going on. When he asked if I knew a certain song by Spinstein, I admitted I didn't. I could only think of American skin, 41 shots, no secret, my friend. You can get killed just for living in your American skin. I knew those lyrics, but I didn't start singing them. I made a mental note to check out the Springsteen song he loved. Eventually, he told me he had been working on diversity inside his company. We still have a long way to go, he said. Then he repeated himself, we still have a long way to go, adding, I don't see color. This is a statement for well-meaning white people whose privilege and blind desire catapult them into a time when little black children and little white children are judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. The phrase, I don't see color, pulled an emergency break in my brain. Would you be bringing up diversity if you didn't see color? I wondered. Will you tell your wife you had a nice thought with, talk with a woman or a black woman, help. All I could think to say was, ain't I a black woman? I asked the question slowly as if testing the air quality. Did he get the riff on Sojourner Truth? Or did he think the ungrammatical construction was a sign of blackness? Or did he think I was mocking white people's understanding of black intelligence? Aren't you a white man, I then asked. Can't you see that? Because if you can't see race, you can't see racism. I repeated that sentence, which I read not long before in Robin DiAngelo's White Fragility. I get it, he said, his tone was solemn. What other inane things have I said? Only that, I responded. I had refused to let the reality he was insisting on be my reality. And I was pleased that I hadn't lubricated the moment Please, I could say no to the silencing mechanisms of manners. Please, he didn't need to open up a vein of complaint. I was pleased he was not passively bullying. And just like that, I was pleased he could carry the disturbance of my reality. And just like that, we broke open our conversation random, ordinary, exhausting, and full of longing to exist in some image of less segregated spaces. Not long after this exchange, a man on the flight got in touch with me. He and his wife had read one of my books and we planned to get together. Our schedules, however, never worked out and time passed. When I wrote the piece about speaking with white men about their privilege, I sent it to him. 
I didn't want to publish it without letting him know I had recounted our conversation. I then asked him if he could respond to what I had written. He wrote back, when you challenged me on my I don't see color comment, I understood your point, appreciated your candor, thought about it, and realized you were right. I saw your response as one of as an act of both courage and generosity. I've thought a lot about our conversation since that flight. In fact, not long afterwards, I realized I had misrepresented something I'd said to you about my hometown. I don't know why. I certainly hadn't done it intentionally. And I believed I was being honest in the moment. But after our talk, it was evident. I told you I didn't notice much tension between the black kids and the white kids in our town. I grew up and went through the public high school system of a middle-class suburb in the Northeast in the 1980s and early 1990s. I guess it's not that I didn't notice it so much as I wanted to forget it. Because thinking back, tension was everywhere. I graduated from high school more than 25 years ago, and except for college summers and a few months after graduation, haven't lived there since. Maybe it was such a moment in our lives that I didn't think about it, except for the overtly ugly incidents, like the time the white kid who sat in front of me in freshman algebra turned around and asked, if I was planning to go to the varsity basketball game that night to watch the racial slur play, I'm assuming it's an N-word. I remember only a couple of physical fights during between black kids and white kids, but cruelty from mostly white to black was always only a moment away. My home and my family, even my extended family, who were first and second generation from Mid Mediterranean and Eastern European countries, were the antithesis of that type of behavior. But thinking back, it was all around us. It's interesting that something in our conversation made me realize it. That response that he gave, I mean, you know, the, the part of it that I find the most moving actually is when he said, I realized that I had misrepresented something I'd said to you about my hometown. I don't know why. I certainly hadn't done it intentionally. And I believed I was being honest in the moment. And so this, the way in which um, our white supremacist uh, foundational orientation, acculturation, whatever you want to call it, um, doesn't allow white people even to understand why they do the things they do. To shield themselves from their own um, fantasies in order not to have to apprehend the realities in front of them is, is something that continues um, to interest me in a way and, um, and, and sort of was the driving uh, force behind Just Us. I'm going to end by reading a page from the end of the book. Fantasies cost lives. Universalized whiteness, that racial imaginary, lives in every moment. We have to be willing to think about this despite spending most of our days not thinking at all. In most cases, we have already decided about everything and everyone. But real thinking, the ethic theorist Lauren Ballant writes, interrupts the flow of consciousness with a new demand for scanning and focus. To be forced into thought is to begin to formulate the event of feeling historical in the present. 
She wants us to jam the machinery that makes the ordinary appear as a flow. Even as we exist as people in relation, people across the table from each other, people talking in a car, on a plane, on the wa at the water fountain, in detention centers, in prisons, at picnics, at work, next door, on trains, in waiting rooms, in classrooms, at bedsides, in taxis, on the subway, at the store, on the street, in the clinic, at the post office, at the DMV, or on Zoom, social distancing, wherever. One conversation has already occurred between you and me as our encounter newly unfolds. Default positions and pathways might already mean that what I imagine doesn't matter given that I am a black woman. What would white people have to graph onto their fantasies so they can treat as real the possibility of true change, true equality? Reimagining agency is the conversation I want to have. How do all of us believe again in our inalienable rights? Agency is right there and I'm willing it forward. Anchored in unknowing, I yearn to rise out of the restlessness of my own forms of helplessness inside a structure that constricts possibilities. Let me ask you, or just tell me why, or better yet, how can we? But who is this we? Is it even possible to form a we? Is this even the question? E pluribus unum might have been the first national mistake. Is there a one that the rest of us should step out of the way of or map ourselves onto. And once that pledge is made, what are we citizens of? We the people are citizens of what? I won't say again the what that gives me pause, but I will quote Fred Moten here, the analysis of our murderer and of our murder is so we can see we are not murdered. We survive, and then as we catch a sudden glimpse of ourselves, we shudder, for we are shattered. Nothing survives. The nothingness we share is all that's real. That's what we come out to show. That showing is or ought to be our constant study. Appropriate that. Is it possible to live e pluribus unum? As a naturalized citizen, I am as connected to the ones who say, go back to where you come from or send her back as I am to the democratic process that names me an American citizen. And as unknowable as I am to anyone else, I am forever remain in relation to everyone else. I am not a part of the one, but I am one. There is no beyond of citizenship. Our lives could enact a love of close reading of who we each are. The love of a newly formed, newly conceived one made up of obscure but sense and unnamed publics in a yet unimagined future. What I know is that an incoherent desire for a future other than the one that seems to be forming our days brings me to a seat around any table to lean forward, to hear, to respond, to await response from any other. Tell me something. One thing, the thing, tell me that thing. Thank you.
I love the automated clap. <laughs> it is not automated. It is from the archive, and I think it's a recording of applause from a previous event you did for us, Claudia. So. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. So, so listen, awesome. everyone, please unmute your mics and join me in thanking Claudia and sharing your, your love and gratitude. And we'll not be having a formal Q&A tonight. And I love that line or any structure that constricts possibility. But uh, we would love to hear how her words resonated with you. Um, so please unmute your mics and say hello. Hey. Thank you. 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 Thank <laughs> I'm in town. <laughs> I, I would pick the wine. I would pick the wine. Oh, oh that's very nice. So, same time next year, all right? All right. All right. So, we usually close our Zoom events by uh, having our author choose uh, what we call an outro tune. And, uh, Claudia, do you want to tell? Oh, maybe we could mute. The mini mouse. I want the Commodores. Oh, I, I know now I would like the Commodores. Uh, I think we can cue that up second. Um, but do you want to tell us why you chose uh, what you chose? Well, I chose Leonard Cohen um, because actually, Skip, you will, you'll recognize it. It was the final song in um, The White Card. And it, it's yes, I do. a conversation, which I, I think maps onto just us in a nice way. So we invite everyone to groove to it, to listen, and then sign off at any point in the song. Thank you all so much for coming.